The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I don't think that I'm being too cavalier when I say that this is one of my all-time favorite Fs of the Tim Graham and Friends vernacular. Bob Glauber, formerly of Newsday. There's a caveat now. There's a there's a there's an article that has to go in front of Newsday, formerly of Newsday. Bob Glauber just retired after 37 years, to which uh, I was stunned when he told me how old he was. I mean, I knew he'd been around for a while, but here I am talking about him like he's not here, which is like his, his funeral. I'm talking about him in the third uh, in in uh, in the third degree. Third person. Bob- I know, but it's it was getting to be third degree there. I was I was on a little bit of a roll. I was just going to start talking about that you're uh, not dead. Well, let's just say you had a great career. Yeah, I was 45 years as a sports writer, 37 in the NFL. So as I told you on the phone the other day, as I was um, getting some takeout from um, what's that? Oh, Popeyes. You know, the last day of my ink stained wretchedom, basically. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm 66, 45 years, 37 in the NFL. I'm tired, but I'm good. I feel good today. So, and you got, 30, me, on, you got me on a good day. 30 of those 37 years as the Newsday NFL columnist. So you had a lot of freedom, although... You have so much material there in New York with the Jets and the Giants, but you were all over the place. Um, But let's let's give give a little bit more of an overview. Let me give a little bit more of a rundown because Bob Glauber is not just Newsday and he's not just the NFL. He covered the Stanley Cup a bunch of times. You started off as a NHL writer. That was your first pro B, correct? Correct. So if we want to kind of get to the Buffalo heart of it so we can kind of get the intro like who the hell is this guy why do I want to listen to him or watch him I covered Gilbert Perot when he was you know that that great line of the Buffalo Sabres played the Islanders back in the day when the Islanders would regularly kind of have their way with that that group and I did get to cover those great teams yes but people don't need a Buffalo connection for Bob Glauber. We yeah, you have been on our you have been on our televisions for how many years at ESPN on the old cold pizza first take, which is where we met when I was working at ESPN and I would do that show. Right. right. That was an eight year run, which in, in network TV for an old sports writer to me was like, that's OK. I'll take that. That was nice. Yeah, I enjoyed that, too. That was my favorite part of working for ESPN. It wasn't the writing. I would occasionally yeah. get to do TV, and that was a lot easier than writing. Oh, yeah. And they paid you the same. And I also want to highlight that Bob Glauber is an accomplished author. Most recently, The Forgotten First with Keyshawn Johnson, which is a story about uh, the black trailblazers of the NFL who don't necessarily get mentioned. And it is as educational as it is uh, entertaining to read, just a fantastic book. Um, And then also Bob wrote Guts and Genius. Although, you know, books today have to, they have to have the quick hit title and then they have the after the colon, which is a chapter in and of itself. So I need to look down at this, Bob. Okay. Uh, Guts and Genius, the story of three unlikely coaches who came to dominate the NFL in the 80s. And uh, the book is about uh, Bill Parcells, Bill Walsh, and uh, Joe Gibbs. And also a fantastic book, which was donated for one of my Make-A-Wish fundraisers. The signed copy went for, I think, $100. 
Wow. And it was signed by Bob Glauber. It wasn't signed by Parcells, Gibbs, or Walsh. That would have been more understandable. But signed by Bob Glauber, it went for $100. Wow. I'm somebody. Well, I keep... All right. So obviously you have an inferiority (laughs) complex because I've been reminding you throughout these first 10 minutes that you are somebody, Bob. It's okay. All right. Just because you're retired doesn't mean you're fading away. All right. When do we get to your hair? Whenever you want. All right. That is spectacular hair. I don't believe that you don't dye it. And... There we go. Thank you. Just let me get that out of the way. This looks out pepper in there. It's starting to creep in. Oh my god! It's just, I'm jealous. It's been an on. It's been an ongoing joke between Bob and me since probably about 2008 that I put shoe polish in my hair. And it is. It's it's my mother's hair. I mean, it's a it's thick head of hair. It's not a hair piece. And if I was gonna color, I would not. Sh- I would not have the beard obviously that the beard gives it away. Like if I really was being self-conscious about my hair, I would not have the white all over my face. I will send you some, just some, just for men. They make it for beards that you can match that up if you want. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Like a reddish, like a a slight red in the Brown. You got it. Great. If you can find that. Yes. No, Uh, Bob, how did you enjoy your first Sunday in retirement? The NFL season just began and a lot of excitement with the two teams that you usually cover. And I think I'd like to start off with Brian Dable, who, you know, on uh, what was it? Uh, what was the headline? One of the headlines had something to do with his balls, day balls or day <laughs> because he went for two late in the game. Steel, I was in New York. steel uh, day ball, balls? day balls of steel. Day balls of steel. That was it. The New York Post. New York Post is on a roll this week. Yes. So what is the New York Giants fan base reaction to Brian Dable? And let's maybe take it before Sunday. Mm-hmm. Let's because we have a, a, a long lead up of mini camp and training camp and all this other stuff. The draft, I guess we can go back there. Joe Shane, Brian Dable, two Buffalo guys come in. What what was their first impression? Did they, did they hit all the right notes leading uh, uh, up through the preseason? You know, it's a good question, Tim. And, and the, the reason I say that is because they were not, especially Dable, you know, he came in with this reputation of kind of a freewheeling, longtime assistant. Um, and I've known Brian for quite a long time, and, and you have as well. You know, behind the scenes, he's, uh, he's a fun-loving guy. He's funny. He's a little irreverent. Um, but he was a little careful. And he's been careful when, when he got the job with the Giants and uh, a little bit more so than we expected. Right. So, OK, that that's understandable. It's a big media market. You just you know, you don't want to make that big mistake. Um, but I think it's funny. Yeah, during the game, it's like, OK, that's Brian Dable. That's the guy that we all know this, you know, risk taking, aggressive. Um, he's going to go for it kind of guy. Um, and you saw him get in Daniel Jones's face after a bad interception late in the game. Um, and then he goes for it for two. They get the win. And then he's dancing, you know, with the with the players in the locker room. So that's the Dable that I think that's the real Brian Dable. Um, but until then, he was a little bit, you know, careful. He's all about his guys. And when I say that, it's um, it's not just uh... – Coaches are like that. You know, Bill Parcells was like that. He famously said in one of the books that was written about him that it's not football that he misses when he kept coming back. It was that he needed some guys. Like he always just needed to be around his group of dudes. Uh, Dable's like that too. Dable, well, unlike Parcells, there's a lot of things that are unlike Parcells, but Dable likes to feed into his players' egos. He will go for records. When you see in the, the notes, the, the weekly notes that the team puts out for the media. And it says that a team needs two more completions for this record. He's looking at all that stuff. He wants to get the records. He wants to say, we did this together. It's a bonding thing. It's a camaraderie. Uh, there was one record. Um, I don't know if it was two years ago or three years ago, but uh, the bills were on the verge of setting a record for most touchdown completions to different targets. Uh, and so 
he was putting offensive linemen in goal line situations as eligible receivers. And if you knew anything about Brian Dable and you were on that defense, you would say that tackle is going to get this ball. And sure enough, he'd be open. Uh, but it's he telegraphs some of this stuff if you're paying attention. But I think that sometimes opposing coaches don't look t- that that's not something that they would take seriously. Looking at the game notes, well, that's not film. You know, that's not. But he takes every he, every little thing that he can do, uh, and so I think going for two feeds into that. I think if it's game if it's game five, maybe he doesn't. But game one, this was a statement he wanted to make, and so pulling it off. He's playing with a little bit of house money, too, probably. I know that New York fans are tough, but what do you think about that, Bob? The fact that he goes for two and wins this game, does his did his leash just get longer? Yeah, I think it it, it more that like he he became kind of a like a cult hero overnight. Now, those things don't last, obviously, and we're going to judge Brian Dable on the long haul. I was thinking about this. I I wanted to say to him, um, hey, nice win, you know, 200 more. Then you think about the Hall of Fame, 200, right? Or if you're Belichick, 300. Right. It's absurd, but but that's how hard it is to win football games. So he knows it's a long haul thing. It's one of the first things he said to the players. One game, either way, does not the season make. But he, <laughs> that was as good a first game for a head coach as you could want. Because, you know, they won the game. They did so based on an aggressive mindset and an aggressive play that worked and you know they celebrated they're on the road um they're playing derrick henry it's hostile circumstances that was as good a vibe that he created as he could have ever wanted how concerned are the media i guess the fans probably don't care about this nearly as much but how concerned um are folks there that we could be looking at somebody who was reverting back to Belichickian personality, because like you say, he's the freewheeler. He was kind of the guy not cut from that cloth, but you're always reminded of Eric Mangini and Matt Patricia trying to do their Bill Belichick impersonations more so than they were trying to be themselves as he got a little tighter than what we were used to knowing from his time as the quarterbacks coach for the jets when Favre was there uh, or, well, yeah, I guess, yeah, he worked with Mangini. Um, it, was there any concern about that? Oh, I may have just lost Bob Glauber. All right, I'm going to hit the pause button. We're going to wait for Bob to come back. Technical difficulties. So, Bob, before I lost you there, and I think that you could not uh, hear the question I was asking, I was just uh, I was curious if there were fears or concerns among the media there that uh, we could be looking at another Bill Belichick knockoff in terms of Dable trying to impersonate uh, much like Matt Patricia and Eric Mangini tried unsuccessfully to do. But it seemed like Dable was getting a little tighter than what we were used to seeing when he was uh, the Bills assistant. Oh, yeah. He's definitely tighter in public um, settings. There, there's no question. I was saying before, he's more careful than we thought he was going to be. You know, I don't think he will do that. I think he is smart enough. He is savvy enough. And he understands the market enough where he won't be able to get away with it. And when you mention those two coaches, Matt Patricia and Eric Mangini, the hair on the back of my neck goes up. Like, oh, no, please, (laughs) no. (laughs) Because we had Mangini here, and it just, you know, they were – that's that's the – you hit it perfectly. Like, they tried to be Bill Belichick. You can't do it. Doesn't work. Now, Joe Judge could have reverted that. In some ways, as a coach, he did. He he just lost that team last year. But – he knew too. And, and Dable and Judge have both been with Saban and Belichick. So they've each taken some things. But for Judge, it was he kind of hung his hat on that. But for Dable, it's like, well, yeah, he was an assistant on a long, circuitous journey. And he and he worked with both of those guys. So and he worked with hard. Mangini in two stops. Yeah, and I think right. that he saw that plane crash uh, be, yeah. with both the Jets and the Cleveland yeah. Browns. Yep. And if you recall that that Mangini 
renaissance phase that he had when he was entering that last season with the Browns and his PR staff decided it was like, all right, let's go ahead and admit we were trying to be like Bel Belichick. This is the real Eric Mangini. And really it was, I know this is going to be the last year of my contract and I need to reinvent myself here. And I think that Brian Dable had a front row seat for all of that and, and probably, probably learned a lesson. But when I started seeing him getting a little chippy in the news conferences and I thought maybe, eh, maybe it's too tempting to, to want to just think what would Bill do in this situation? Yeah. And that's a fair point. And I, and I don't, I don't dismiss the possibility that over time, because the guy's going to lose football games and he's going to go through crises and it's going to be tough. And, you know, the world's going to collapse on him in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, we, we don't know how he's going to react to that. And he might kind of turtle up and go into a shell. Um, but I think, again, he's smart enough where he's going to figure out how to, how to kind of fight his way out of it without falling victim to that um, cycle. And I, I think he's aware of it. But again, you don't know until they get in that circumstance, man. And when it gets hot, people react differently to stress and, and he'll react his own way. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you what your uh, thoughts were on the Thursday night football game between the uh, Buffalo Bills and the Los Angeles Rams. Um, I'm assuming you watched it. Yeah, I watched that. Did you not? Because if you said, Tim, I didn't watch it, then I would no, have Tim, thrown Tim, my Tim, hands I'm, up. And Yeah, I'm retired. I'm still I love football and I'll still watch football. I just watch it without. You know, I got to tell you, my wife says last night watching the game, she goes, how does it feel to, like watch a game knowing you don't have to write? I go. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> Above average. Sorry, I like this, <laughs> but you watch a lot of football without having to write. Right. You know, yeah, I yes. Primetime games I, and whatnot. You know, listen, I've had enough stress on Monday night games going back to the, you know, to 1985. The first Monday night game I covered, Tim. I saw that Joe, in your column. Joe Theismann broke his leg. I'm like, oh, my God. What's, it's unbelievable. So, Do you recall how long that game was delayed? I, do, I don't, but I don't know if you remember about, because that's probably, a tight deadline. You're writing a yeah. night game for the first time. And you're, I mean, you covered hockey, so that's a yeah. deadline sport. But still. Maybe 15 minutes. I mean, 15, 20 minutes, 30. Oh. Had to get an ambulance on the field, I believe, um, or a cart. And it, was, it was devastating. But that was I'll, I'll never forget that. But but it's just nice to watch it. And like especially a game like, you know, the Seattle game where it comes down to it. Buffalo game was was not well, not close at the end. Um, but I did. I did watch um, most of that game. And it was uh, it was good. It was a good game to follow by a, a matter of hours, a prediction that the Bills would win the Super Bowl. Um, so I, you know, I felt pretty good. That's really all I care about is how did I, how did I look? And um, Josh you know. Allen looked good. And this is where I, uh, throw my bouquets. Uh, I wrote a story about Josh Allen and, uh, how he could be the real deal in terms of an all timer. And of course that's too soon to say, but that's not going to stop us from taking a look at it. And in trying to tell that story, I reached out to Bob Glauber for advice because as a guy who literally wrote the book on Bill Walsh, um, well, and two other guys, but still, uh, I'm not going to let that get in the way of my uh, poetic license. <laughs> um, I asked Bob Glauber how I should attack this story, and he gave me some great advice, and that's, uh, that's how the story came to be. Did you ever put that <clears throat> tagline for me at the end or no? Uh, sure, I did. Okay. I got to check. No, I that. didn't. I didn't. Uh, had I known that you actually read the article, I would have, uh, I would have told the truth, but I'm just guessing that you, since you're admitting that you didn't, uh, yeah, it's there. I actually have not read that. That was in the throes of the later, you know, I was like retiring at that time. So I had a little things going on. But. You, yes, you were busy. You were too busy. <laughs> but I will, uh, I will read it. I being you. brought to tears by the owners that you're supposed to be covering. Yeah, that was that was really something. I wasn't brought to tears by them, but that was um, it was an interesting day. Let's go. Let's go through that. And sure. is that something that you would ever anticipate? You were brought onto the field for the Jets Giants preseason game. 
um, given a commemorative half jersey of each team and the owners who are incredibly respected owners. I mean, it's not like Jimmy Haslam had you down there. Um, <laughs> these are guys who you would have gravitas, Woody Johnson and, and John Mara. And in front of the 350 fans who were at the game, uh, uh, gave you your uh, moment. I, that's pretty cool. It was really cool, Tim. Um, I was shocked. <clears throat> um, I, I expected nothing. And my, my plan was to just go to the Jets and Giants game. Um, and that would be the last game to say goodbye to my colleagues in the press box. That was the idea of it. Um, I, you know, it's, it's a little weird, you know, people don't retire, but once hopefully, and you know, how do you do it? Especially in this business when a lot of people don't get that choice. So my thought was go to the hall of fame game, say goodbye to the national pukes, and then go to the jets and giants and say goodbye to the people that have meant so much to me over the years, my colleagues in the press box. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting online uh, for a little pregame meal and uh, the jets PR guy goes, Hey, I need you come, come with me. I go, I, I, I come with me. Um, and they had this surprise that, I, that blew me away. It just blew me away. And I, I, I hear you on that, you know, you're covering them, but like, no, well, it's over. And to know that there was that kind of feeling that they would go to do that at the, at a game. Um, I, I was, that was remarkable. Um, so I, you know, I was, I was kind of speechless. Well, I'm busting your proverbials when I say that uh, it, it is, no, it's, it's about fair, respect it's fair point, you know, but it's about respect. You're not going to wear the Jersey. I don't think, but, are you going to, you're not going to wear the Jersey. Are you actually, I took it out of the, you know, I, I might. No, <laughs> <laughs> I you can, about it. You know, go ahead, go ahead. wear it when they play in the Super Bowl. No, I'm not going to wear it. It was framed beautifully. And there were a couple of footballs from each team and it was, it was very cool. I am not going to lie. It was really uh, unique. And, you know, I've prided myself on conducting myself in a way that, you know, you got to write what you write and you got to write what you believe. But you know what? You got to show up the next day and you can't ignore that. You can't shirk that. Um, and I, I, I lived by that. And, and to kind of see that recognized or, um, um, just appreciate it was, was, was cool. I'm sorry. You know, it's, it, it was cool. You don't have to apologize to me. Okay. Thanks. I know you were worried about it. Yeah. Um, what were the, uh, you've been thinking about some superlatives I'm, I'm guessing. So I'm just going to ask this cause it pops into my head. Like you had a sure. nice moment there with the owners what was the worst moment you had or what was the greatest friction you ever found on the beat covering the giants or the jets? Uh, well, that, that friction goes back to Bill Parcells. Um, it's the 1987 season, I think in training camp, uh, there, it was in training camp, Pace university in Westchester County, New York and it's 87. They had already won the super bowl. Um, but there were reports that LT was having problems with cocaine again. And um, around that same time, Dwight Gooden of the Mets was having a problem with that. And I remember a story um, that kind of talked about Gooden drinking and that experts said drinking would lead back to his drug of choice eventually. It just, that just kind of registered. Well, in training camp that year, LT had already been through rehab once and um, he, he was drinking again. He, I knew the people at the local bars and, you know, he was drinking and it was a similar story. And, I, you know, in, in writing it, I had to go to LT. I had to go to Parcells before it was printed. Um, uh, Parcells tried to bully me off the story. He's like, hey, he's got LT's got attorneys. You, you know, you're going to be in trouble, that kind of thing. So I wrote the story. Um, LT was like, I had to approach LT. Listen, this, this is what I got. I explained it to him and he's on his way to dinner. And he goes, I don't give a shit what you write. Like, okay, but I'm like, Lawrence, this is what I got. And um, so um, the next day showed up because you have to 
and in the press conference, and there's only about eight, 10 writers around Parcells at that time. It's different times. And he goes, um, I asked him a question, a very generic question about something else because I already asked him about LT and, you know, the story came out. So um, I asked him a question and he, he just glares at me and says, that was a horseshit story and you're a horseshit for writing it. Silence, you know, very awkward, 10 seconds go by and he got it out. I didn't say anything and, you know, you, you, you had to take it. So Bill and I got off to a very rocky start because he was a bully and I knew it and I, you know, I, but I was willing to stand up when I had to. And he, A, didn't like it, but B, respected it. So you go through the cycle. Well, he, he's going to challenge you and you stand up to it. And he says, OK, I, I respect that. That kind of morphed into this relationship over 30 years plus that was like, I, I've not had a, a relationship like it in journalism since. To, to the point where when it was time to retire, one of the people I asked about it was Bill Parcells. And, you know, he kind of gave me some advice on it. Uh, I don't cover him anymore. So it was okay, journalistically. And he, he was great. Um, so that was the, the, the one moment of stress and antagonism but it morphed into that so that's why tim i've always it's a people business and if you can deal with people you, you'll be okay um when did you feel like you were finding yourself on equal footing again with parcells after that how long do you think it took what do you, what do you mean equal footing meaning like he he didn't hold it you knew he wasn't going to hold a grudge you didn't ask a question wondering you know even in the back of your mind where you get it out of your head that this is you know this guy's got a problem with me or i need to be art more artful than i would with somebody else um you know they're just these different mental gymnastics that you go through yeah, when you know sure. when you're approaching somebody who you're not you're not too sure where you stand I, I, that's a good question and i'm thinking back to the time w when he was there and i it was always a little bit of tension. Even after that, you know, we got over that. Um, there's a little I think bit even when you get along with Parcells, there's some tension, right? Yes, even as yes. he's answering your question gracefully, he's always kind of, you, you wonder if he's, he's, he, he's getting ready to, you know, he's holding the hammer behind his back. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, he would come down. He, he loved to engage with the press. He would come down after practice, um, walk through the press room at Giant Stadium. We called it the dungeon. Uh, you know, no windows, concrete room that we're just hacking around down there. Um, and he would come light up a cigarette after practice um, and shoot the breeze with the reporters. <clears throat> so, but I, but I, but Vinny, T Vinny Detrani was his favorite guy. He worked, worked for the Bergen record. So Vinny and he always got along and I knew that. And I could never, I could never aspire to that because it's like, I'm not, I'm not here to be his friend. So there was always a little tension. And I remember, like, Tim, the last question of his Super Bowl press conference after the Giants beat the Bills in a huge upset, his contract was not, you know, taken care of, right? It, he had not re-signed a contract. So after all, he's answered all these questions about the Super Bowl, this moment of exultation. And I said, listen, now that the game is over, I figured it was the time to, to ask it. Have you thought about what your future holds with the Giants? And he takes this, uh, yeah, like a handheld mic, right? He, he's got a strap on his uh, on his chest. And he looks at me. And he goes, he just, he just, and he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> I I ruined his moment, but the next day we were fine. He, you know, he was regaling the media in the team hotel, and you know. Talking to Dave Anderson, the my idol and legendary New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, he says, you know, football, winning the Super Bowl is it, it's the best thing in the world. It's better than sex. Like, you know, so, you, you know, you deal with the um, the bullying and the and the difficult antagonistic relationship uh, and you do. Now, he came back with the Jets and there was a little bit more of that, but there was also understanding. And I think it was when he became the general manager of the jets for one season, that's when it finally turned. That's when he and I were kind of, he, he just, we, we both backed off or something. It's 
because he wasn't in the arena coaching. And that's when the relationship kind of got into this more of a, you know, uh, friendlier, um, less combative uh, kind of thing. And, and it's been like that ever since. So, you know, with the book, he was, my God, unbelievable as far as access. And I, you know, I had to call him a million times to, to cre- you know, confirm facts and, and that kind of stuff. So he was great. I wonder, Bob, if him uh, turning the corner in terms of tolerance, and I'm guessing generally when it comes to personalities who are interviewed a lot, it's from the criticism. It's not obviously because you you uh, made the wrong joke. You know, it's uh, it was a criticism. But when he became the general manager, he was having the same criticisms of his coaches or of his of what was going on around him, maybe. Sure, sure. Yeah, he was, was like, a, "Oh wait, I, now I understand." Right, not, not, but he always understood, and he accepted it. You know, he listen. His first year, he was almost fired by the Giants. I mean, th- there was unanimous agreement among the brain trust of the Giants, the co-owners. Now they were warring. The Maras, uh, the two Tim Mara and Wellington Mara, were not speaking on speaking term, but he, them, and George Young were basically, yeah, we 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 have to look elsewhere. 312 and one. They went after Howard Schnellenberger from Miami. He couldn't get out of his contract. Parcells never forgot it, but he was given a second chance. And then within three years, he won a Super Bowl on the way to the Hall of Fame. Um, so, you know, he he always kind of got it and he and he understood it. And and he could I think he was helpful for his general for his coaches when he became a general manager in uh, New York and, and in Miami. Um, and you know what? To this day, Tim. There might not be a person, and I say this with all sincerity, there might not be a person on earth who has consulted more about football stuff than Bill Parcells. Yeah. I think everybody calls him. Yeah. You'd be hard pressed. I mean, Polian's maybe in the conversation, but I don't think that's the case, especially when he was on TV. That kind of takes that 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 changes the the personality a little bit or the the uh, the dynamic. Um, you know, Ernie Accorsi to an extent, but yeah, Parcells. And I, I think he, Bill. he welcomes it all. I think that's, that's his why. way of staying. Yeah. It's his way of staying involved. Yeah. And he, you know, he doesn't do it. For, he doesn't get money. He does. He does it because he loves um, the people in the business. And, you know, he had a coach when he was younger, he had a basketball coach in high school named Mickey Corcoran. And he will say, Mickey taught me, you always give back. You always help your coaches. You always do it. Never, ever forget that. And, and he still does that. He's 81 years old. You mentioned uh, Dave Anderson of the New York Times being your idol. How come? Dave covered sports in such a way that was, you know, he, he did it the way I, I had hoped to do it. That is, you write it hard, you write it fair, and you show up. And you are going to be respected. People might not always agree with you, but you're going to have that respect. And the way he wrote columns, he wrote columns so thoroughly. They were always clear. It was not fancy writing, but they're always clear. And he talked to people. And that was the difference with Dave Anderson as far as he would talk to people and he'd include it. He'd, He'd have that institutional knowledge in the column. You knew it. You just knew it when you read it. And, you know, I had an interesting, um, it's 30 years ago and probably around this time, uh, I had a conversation with Carl Banks at his locker. He's a linebacker with the Giants, a Pro Bowl linebacker, great player. Um, so it's 92 and they are in the Ray Handley era and it's not going well. So that was my first year as columnist at Newsday, 92. And I, did, you know, I was uncertain, like, how do I do this? How, you know, I didn't, I didn't think it through, like, you know, just be Dave Anderson. You know, Dave Anderson had this uh, saying, when in doubt, write the quarterback, right? Always, always perfect football writer mentality. Well, in my mind, you know, if as a journalist, when in doubt, be Dave Anderson. And, and those that now, I, it wasn't always that way. So 30 years ago, I'm like, how do I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm standing in front um, by Carl Banks's locker and there's a scrum around him. And I'm in the back of the scrum all the way in the back. And I used to be up front 
as a beat reporter, I knew the players very well and they knew me. So I'm hanging out in the back and he notices it. And he goes in front of all the writers now, Hey, Hey, Glauber, what are you doing back there, man? And I, I'm like, I look around. Yeah. What are you, what are you doing? How come you come up? How come you're standing in the back now? What's that? So I didn't say anything really. Uh, you know, I was, it was very awkward. Well, after the scrum broke up, he, he says, come here. And I go, um, what's up? He goes, well, what, what, what's, what's happening? I mean, Carl, I'm a columnist now. I, I, I think I gotta, I gotta be different. You know, I have to, I have to criticize you guys. Like I'm not the beat guy anymore. I, so I have to be in a position where I'm going to be critical. And I, I feel like I have to kind of disassociate a little bit. So he says, Oh no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. Bob. I'm telling you, do not do that. And, and, and here's why uh, you can rip me. All right. And, and I'm fine with that. But if you rip me, I want to know that you know why you're ripping me and that it's legitimate. And the only way you know that, and I know that, is by you staying engaged with us. Don't change, man. That's not you. Don't do it. And I have thought about that so much over the years and more now. I'm like, you know what? Because that immediately just hurt, took the pressure off. It's like, oh, okay. All right. All right. That's how you do it. You, you don't change. You be yourself. You're going to write opinions, but you're going to report it out. And being a reporting columnist is, is, a, is a difference. And I, I just never forgot it. Um, I spoke to him probably a year or two ago about that. I go, hey, Carl, you remember that conversation we had? He goes, oh, yeah. I'll never forget that. Yeah. I said, be yourself. I said, man, I can't thank you enough. It's, it was unbelievable. Now, do, do you think, did Carl Banks know that you were a columnist now, or he was just noticing that you weren't as part of the scrum aspect of it? Was, um, he, was he savvy enough to know that your role had changed, which I think would be striking because I don't think players now give a shit. Yeah, I think he did. And the, the lines are blurred too. Beat writers end up writing columns and yep. it, the players don't even know what, what your role is when you're there at the, in the locker room anymore anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he knew at that time. Um, and, and he was very savvy and think about that. I mean, that, that, it's, um, it's just such a blessing to have grown up journalistically during that era when there was much more engagement with the players and coaches, Bill Belichick, you know, walking across the locker room. Hey, Bill, you got a moment. What happened in that game? He's, he's got his pencil in his ear. He says, yeah, give, give me a notebook. He scribble down, you know, the play Belichick Coughlin. Talk to him on a daily basis. Just, you know, how's the family? Um, uh, Ron Aaron, oh, all, all the coaches, you know, guys who became head coaches themselves and the guy who became the, the, the winningest playoff coach of all time, Bill Belichick. I mean, so to, to be in that era was great. And now Carl Banks could interact with us enough to know and make the distinction that, oh, Glauber's, you know, he's got a column job now. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm, t I'm just blown away more. The more I think about that, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta talk to him a little bit more about that one. It was phenomenal advice. A seminal moment. It was, it really was. Even if you don't think about it, what's the word I'm looking for? Palpably is not the right word, but even if it's not at the forefront, that probably is something that rewired you a little bit and is went through your thinking every time or most times you were in a locker room as to whether you're going to stand in the back or stand in the front, Carl Banks kind of made that decision for you. He, you know, he really did, Tim. And I think what it, what it did also, you know, that thing about wanting to be Dave Anderson, just be Dave Anderson. I'm not a, never going to win a Pulitzer prize. And I'm not saying it for that. It's just the behavior and the approach. That's what, that's what it is. And it, you know, Carl saying that made me realize, you know, you don't have to be a flamethrower. To, to do this job right. And sometimes there is that I was more like, okay, I've got to be, I've got to be a, a, a jerk. I've got to like be a flamethrower. And I, you know, that's not me. That's not my personality. I'm more, you know, circumspect. I'll try to think it through fair minded. Um, and, and, you know, but being fair minded sometimes, Hey, you know, is there longevity in that? Is it boring? 
you know, so right. you gotta, you gotta pick spots. I mean, listen, there've been plenty of spots to pick to, to, to write it hard and I'll do that, but you don't have to be beholden to that. And I think it's fairly common too. I'm not saying maybe more than more often than not, but I think we can come up with a group of columnists who feel it is their, not only their right, but maybe even their obligation not to seek out extra information. The whole thing being, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't need to go talk to somebody else about this. This is what I think. Whereas the way I work is I might not know my opinion on something for a couple of days, which is why I'm, I don't like being a columnist. And I've had people say, Oh, Tim, you'd be really good at it. Um, And I think it's because people see Twitter or just my person, I have an edge or a snark and like, yeah, I could probably throw some good lines together, but I can't do the on deadline opinion and I need to talk to people. And it's just, I, I, I'm not cut out for it. Um, But I think that's part of it. Like what you say with Dave Anderson or yourself is um, you can, you can be a reporter still the beat writer and then be a columnist. And that's a, that's a, that's a comprehensive approach that allows you to write with conviction as opposed to the guy who's navel gazing and says, yeah. well, I'm going to go back on, you know, what I remember from, there was a game last season that this reminds me of. I'm just going to say it's all that, you know, there's, um, or, uh, you know, this was, this was a dumb play call and I'm going to tell you why without going to the locker room, you know, there's, right. there's a lot of that too much of it. I always, I, I'm a little old school in that you got to show up and, having been a beat reporter, I think that's the best training that there is. Whereas if I had come in as a columnist and that's a, that was very rare at that time. Um, I, I'm glad I was a beat reporter. It's a life shortening experience and I didn't have to do it for that long a period of time, but it was great. It's great training. And to be a reporting columnist, that to me, you know, look, I, I, I last, I lasted a while doing it. And it was kind of proof that, you know, you can do this thing fairly. And, um, without sacrificing, you know, without being a homer, uh, without being too shrill, you, you got to find the balance. And so, yeah, Carl Banks and Dave Anderson, the two greatest influences in my writing life. <laughs> classic, classic Carl Banks, always taking oh. journalists, uh, uh, you know, and uh, sitting them down by the fireplace. And, you and know, telling them I, I got to the... tell you, Tim, Tim, the other thing with Carl Banks now, now Banks, was able to, he's one of those players, you know, he, he, he'd like to share the experience, you know, in, in that way, writers and players are, we, we have this commonality that brings us together in some way. And I think you see that when players go to a different team, they see you in a locker room. It's like, Hey, you know, this familiarity, there, there is a bond there. So banks it's, it's 1987. They had just won the Super Bowl. They're in Chicago for the opener on a Monday night. Mike Eisen, who was with at NJ dot or the New York star ledger at the time. And I are going back to the hotel. We're in the lobby and the giants are walking through. Now, when you, when you, we see football team walking through the lobby, it's a pretty impressive sight. They're just heading back to their rooms. So they pass. And uh, these two guys, these two fans are there just like looking at that. They're just gazing at them, at the players. And, and Eisen and I over here, two guys say, Hey, you see banks. Oh, effing big, man. And they high five. And they high five each other. Effing big. Banks. So, like, the next week, I go, hey, Banks. We saw these two guys, man. They were like, Banks. Effing big. And uh, so I will see Carl Banks today. Hey, Banks. And he'll go, big. (laughs) He's, you know, in his 50s. And I'm in my 60s. That's awesome. You know, it popped into my head. I never thought of it as somebody who also started as his first beat covering the NHL like you did. How do you think being in those locker rooms, and maybe baseball is even more of an incubator for this, but how, whether it be the NBA or the NHL, multiple games within a week, high-pressure situations, on deadline, not only for you filing the story, but having to ask tough questions, of course, your Islanders teams that you covered were pretty good. Probably not a ton of tough questions, but when you have to go in and stick your microphone in front of a guy's face who just got off the ice two or three times a week, um, as opposed to doing it once a week, 
there's a, there's, I don't know. It just popped into my head as something like maybe that was probably some pretty good training um, yeah. to, to, to cover the NFL. Cause I think the NFL is easier than, than some of the other sports. Well, I think the NFL there's more, well, there has been, and, and it's different now because the media is just so big and unwieldy, but during the week, it's more casual. You know, there's not pressure during that week. And after the games, you know, it's that compressed period of time. It's difficult. Hockey players. Now hockey players are, are different collectively. They're, 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 they seem a little wired differently. It was never, you know, there were different personalities and I'm thinking back to that Islanders team. So, well, like, there's a brotherhood and a code and loyalty. And that, that's not to say that it doesn't exist in football, but it's so much more heightened in hockey than any other sport. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is. And, you know, I grew up playing hockey, so I kind of felt like I knew the spirit of a hockey player a little bit better than, you know, because I, you know, if, if you hadn't played that. So, but the Islanders, you know, they had the, the personalities. Gilly's always approachable. Um, We'll talk to you, whatever. Bossy, very um, high strung. And, and you had to be a little careful because he was he was high strung. Trottier would never really tell you anything, but he'd be very polite, but introspective. Um, you know, Billy Smith, the crazy goalie who nearly killed Lindy Ruff. Um, uh, he was this is happy. He was who he, he, he you thought he was this happy. Goal. So I remember the personalities. And that's that's what you that's what you deal with at any sport. And, and football players have their own unique uh, qualities. And that's why, to me, if you're going to be if you're going to cover football, there's two stories you got to work on comprehensively away from the game. And that's injuries and life after football, um, because th th it's very unique to that sport. The injury factor is 100 percent. And the life after football stuff is so important and they all go through it. It's really, really tough. So, you know, Bob, uh, it's been 50 minutes with the exception of, uh, your technological, um, difficulties. Oh, blame me. Uh, I'm going to dock you for two minutes. Um, what do you want to talk about that? I didn't ask you about. Um, well, the 50 minutes thing reminds me of Harry Carson, another old time giants writer, uh, player, who is probably my favorite person to have covered over 37 years because I started uh, in 85 when he was with the Giants. And, and the last guy that I saw on the last road trip that I made for Newsday at the, going to the Hall of Fame was Harry Carson. And I hugged him after I told him, I said, hey, Harry, you know, this is my last trip. I'm so glad to see you. Um, but Harry, we, we would talk for a long time. And, the, and one of the most recent times we talked, he, he says, you know, Bob, we've been on the phone for an hour. And he says, I never, I never charged you for, for our conversations. I go, Harry, you know what? You want to, you want to start, go ahead, start the meter, Harry. Go ahead. What do you want to charge me? Huh? Penny, a, penny a minute? Go, let's go for it. So, <laughs> and just, your, your 50 minute thing reminded me of that. Now we're well, good. I, I think you're you doing me the favor here, Bob. Okay. I, I, I do. I but, owe you. You should have felt, the meter going. Yeah, but 50 felt like 15. So that's a, a good sign. Well, good. Um, I've enjoyed your work, Timothy. Um, so thank you for that. And I will continue to enjoy it. And I will have to go, I will, you know, today read your story that I wrote for you on Josh Allen. You're going to continue to enjoy it, even though you haven't. W what do you mean? You oh, just no. said, yeah, uh, you haven't. I didn't read the one story. Listen, you know, I, and I'll never forget the Bjorn Nitmo stuff. That's I didn't write that. Uh, who was it? Yeah, I did. I did. I wrote it. I, I just want such a, I won't say. It. Hey, uh, show everybody your uh, Mike uh, Garofolo bought you a. No, it's Mike. Mike Giardi. Oh, Mike Giardi bought you a retirement gift. Can you show everybody? And then, oh, you, oh, you put the finger away. Oh, you're getting bold in your dotage. Yes. He goes, and, I get Mike Giardi's a good friend of mine, works for NFL Network, and he sends me. Uh, likewise, one of the all time great guys that when you see guy. him, you are yep. happy to see him. Absolutely. Um, so he sent me um, a couple of boxes of butterscotch pudding because he, he always says, listen, you old bastard. 
I'm going to be feeding you butterscotch pudding in the home <laughs> in a couple of years. All right. So relax. And then he got me this mug that says effing quitter. <laughs> effing <laughs> quitter. Uh, and then in small type, I mean, happy retirement. <laughs> so I drink from this mug every day. That's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Mike Giardi, he's an F. He's a, he's on TGAF. He's a, yeah. he's a well-known accomplished F as ours, as is now Bob Glauber. Oh, so I had to freaking work 37 years in football, retire, and now I'm an F. Okay. I an F. You're, you're, you're a minted. You're officially minted. Okay. You were unofficial. You're off you know, the books, F. Yeah, okay. Giardi is older than I am, too, so. <laughs> sure he is. Sure he is. Do you give him the business about, oh, he's got salt and he's got gray hair. Oh, yeah, I don't get have to worry about that. Oh, I get And he used to color it. I go, dude, you better start coloring your hair again, man. It's a young man's business. <laughs> Bob, I've enjoyed this. Hey, oh, I guess before we let you go, this is a Western New York centric audience that we are. We I was have trying here. to help you with that. I well, I didn't care about that. I wanted I wanted to talk about Bob Glauber. Uh, your thoughts on the Bills? I love the Bills. As I said, watching them destroy the Rams on opening night, hours after putting in print that the Bills were going to win the Super Bowl. Was, was, was a good thing. No, I, I really like, I like this team. I like the way it's been built. This team has been built by Brandon Bean in a very old school, 80s, 90s, traditional way. How so? Well, he, he built, you got the quarterback. You got to start with the quarterback. You, and you build out. You build the lines. You, you. You backfill, you get great players, you don't draft for need, you draft good players. Then when you are close enough, you know, you, you make the big trade uh, for your star receiver. You pay the bigger money for the free agents that you've got to keep. So, um, you know, we talked about Bill Parcells being a, um, uh, a sounding board for, for people. Well, Brandon Bean's one of his, one of his guys, all right? Bean is a Parcells guy and Parcells in, in a lot of ways is, is his imprint is on this team, just the way it's built. And, um, you know, Parcells would always say to me, he says, Hey, you ever see that guy, Brandon Bean in Buffalo, you tell him I'm still looking for, he's still looking for his golf ball. So they used to play golf. Parcells was friends with Dan Henning. And when they were in Carolina, Henning was with, uh, with, uh, Brandon Bean when Bean was a young scout and uh, they played golf and, and they hit it off. And uh, so he hit a shot awry, like went into uh, onto the highway nearby. So Parcells will always reference that, that moment, but you know, it's, it's, it's a sign. So I, I think it's a really good team, well-built team. I think Josh Allen is the goods. Um, so there's, there's, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to, to be the best they can be. And I think the best they can be is Super Bowl champs. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think they are the best team in the NFL. And I think that my 20, well, let's see, my 15, 16 years of covering the NFL has proven that I am not a Bills homer. And uh, I have not uh, gone out of my way to praise EJ Manuel slash Doug Marone, uh, Dick Jaron, um, you know, yeah, we, Tim, you're you, Tan Gailey's a nice fella. In fact, one of my all-time favorite people, Chan Gailey is, but they weren't winning a Super Bowl. Buddy Nix, who doesn't love Buddy Nix? But yeah. I'm ready to say this is a team that can win it all. Wow. I'm glad I don't make predictions, though, because even if they are the best team in the NFL, what does that give them, a 10% chance? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Tough. listen, I, I, now you're talking to a guy who's old enough to understand the soul and the psyche of Buffalo fans – who are toward, you know, scarred from four straight losses, right? Where were you for the kick? I was in the for press Scott box. Norwood's kick. I was in the press box in Tampa Stadium, looking, looking down below, wondering what the hell I'm gonna write. Good or bad. Um that was one of the most that was I'll never forget that game because they, you know, I had to back the run up to the Iraq war, the first Iraq war. And that was that was intense, man. That was absolutely intense. Those planes flew over to 
you know, for after the anthem, they flew over the stadium. I thought we were, we were being bombed. I, did, I had no idea what was going on. It was it was intense times, and and that game kind of was was one of the most incredible games that that you'd ever want to see. Can I can I ask you if I can squeeze out one more question? If you of course, recall man. What, of course. what it was like to file after that game, because it is the ultimate. Either way, you can't talk about next week or shaking it off. It's either the championship or not the championship. How much did you have written already? Where what were you? I guess. How how were you handling deadline at that moment? I would say, you know, I don't I don't remember specifically, you know, what my deadline was. Like, you probably had to get it in at the buzzer, and then you can you can sub it out. So I did get a chance to go down to the locker room, and that's when Parcells, you know, I ended his I ended his final press conference as, as a Giants coach after a game with him throwing the mic. Um, so we had as if time. it wasn't stressful enough. I know. Uh, but 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 uh, I thank God I got to go to that locker room and that scene because it was it was incredible. Uh, you know, Parcells, um, as he was going up to his own podium, he, he passed by Jumbo Elliott, who had done a really good job against Bruce Smith. And he goes, um, he's walking by, hey, Jumbo, you're an ass kicker, man. You're an ass kicker. Right. And Jumbo just looks over and starts smiling. And, you know, the, 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 the raw emotion of that moment and that whole scene was, was incredible. Yeah. I, I don't know that I'd remember it. You remember it. You remember it. Yeah. I remember, you know, I never covered a Super Bowl for a beat, you know, on the team I was covering, I've covered Super Bowls as more like a national type writer to, you know, or, you know, writing for the Buffalo news or the athletic, but you know, I'm getting the best story. I, I didn't cover the team mm-hmm. you know, uh, all season. Um, I remember some of the deep runs that the Sabres made the Eastern conference finals game seven of the Eastern concert conference finals. And I remember just like flashes, mm-hmm. like a goal, one goal, or, I remember maybe the mood of the locker room after the, I'm sorry, the dressing room uh, <laughs> as, uh, as I walked in that type of stuff, but I don't, yeah, I have trouble with like all of the. I, I, for some reason, I remember that stuff. You know, my daughter, uh, my younger daughter re- remembers things from like years ago. She said, daddy, when, when we, we took a bike ride, when I was, you know, 12 and you said this, fortunately I said kind of good things. And, I, you know, she, she'll re- remind me of them. I was like, oh, thank God. that was. But I've got that, I don't know, for some reason, I got that memory thing going on. And, it, and it's, it's great. Um, and, it's, and it's lucky. Maybe there's something that goes with the hair. You know, too much what? color in there. Everything seeps out of my brain and goes into coloring the hair. Okay. If I had gray hair, maybe I'd have better memory. Hey, listen, listen, man. If I could write like you. I'd be friggin' Hemingway. Okay. So kiss my butt. So, so what you're saying I, is I fail to live up to my expectations. No, you are, you're a great writer. I, you say I, if, if you could write like me, you'd be like Hemingway, but how come I'm not like Hemingway? I don't know. To because you're, I'm, because I'm wasting, I'm wasting <laughs> my skills. No, you're fine. Wait, you're fine. You're a talented thank you for, writer. Thank you for the backhanded compliment. No, no, that, that, that came out wrong. That came out wrong. But you know, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're, I am kissing my ass. I'm I saying, get it. No, no, no. Here's what I'm saying. I am not. I wish I was a more gifted writer like you. That's what I'm saying. Because well, that's nice of you to say. Yeah. I think you're full of shit, but I think no, it's nice of you to say. No, I, I, I always will say I could be a better writer. Always. Um, and that, uh, that'll never change. I'll still hopefully write books. And that's what I want to do. Like, I, I want to write books where I can kind of devote my full attention to it. It's hard to do it when you've got a full-time job, uh, when you've got a full-time job. So I'm curious to see how, like, I'm no, no more excuses. Just be, be as right. excellent as you can be. And, and that's I'll, something we I'll talked about. I, my, yeah. I don't want to write. I would love to write books, but I can't bring myself to do it in my free time because... I already write for torture. You know, it's, I, I don't like it. I want my free time. I want to do anything, but right. Um, but right. 
Um, <laughs> let me plug your books again. Uh, the Forgotten First with Keyshawn Johnson, which can we talk? There was a little bit of you gave me a little nugget about that. Uh, can we mention that? Is it I don't I don't want to that there's maybe another phase for the oh, Forgotten First to come. I don't know. We'll, we'll no? see. OK, we'll that leave that there. Say, yeah. No. And also Guts and Genius, the story of three unlikely coaches who came to dominate the NFL in the 80s. And that book's about Bill Parcells, Bill Walsh and Joe Gibbs. Oh, the Forgotten First uh, is about uh, the forgotten uh, African-American trailblazers of the National Football League. Guys like Kenny Washington, Bill Willis, Marion Motley and uh, and many more who are greats. And, you know, the name Marion Motley, like I, I I'm from Cleveland. I grew up a Browns fan. I know that Marion Motley existed, but I didn't know his story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Four, four guys, you know, broke the color barrier permanently in, in, in pro football. Um, Woody Strode, Kenny Washington with the Rams and Motley and Bill Willis with the Browns in 1946. It's a really interesting look back, an untold story that, you know, you could tell that story a million times and people, everyone knows Jackie Robinson. And two of these guys played with Jackie Robinson at UCLA, but it was Robinson who is famous for integrating baseball a year after these guys did it with football. So right. fascinating story. And, the, the, you know, they got some, the families were great. Um, and they, and they got recognized at the hall of fame over this past summer with a Ralph Hay pioneer award, which, you know, Keyshawn and I think it's because of the attention that the book, shine you know the light that shined on these guys and and, and we're it's really gratifying to see that you continue to do admirable work bob thank you i don't want to get You're a hero of mine i don't want to get tapped on the shoulder tim hey bob it's time wait right i home? hear that yeah i hear that well you're a hero of mine well you're my dave anderson uh and bob. uh thank you for doing this podcast I appreciate it, Tim. And you've always been a hero of mine. I wish I could write like you. Just accept it and move on. Be happy. Be happy you got that skill. I'm going to say something that it sounds like I'm complimenting myself, but I think it was such bullshit. Uh, So I'm sitting there talking to Sam Farmer in the press box in Los Angeles, and I happen to be sitting in Bill Plaschke's seat. Bill Plaschke comes back from getting a cup of coffee or whatever, and I stand up and I say, I'm sorry. And I say, hi, I'm Tim Graham from The Athletic. And he says, oh, Tim Graham from The Athletic. What an honor. And I was like, the fuck? Bill Plaschke? Yeah, I think he says that to everybody. Oh, you think he was glad hadn't you? I th- no, I think he was. Yeah, I think it was a little thick. It was he's, a little thick. He's got humility. Some, some occasional faux humility, but, you know. <laughs> I've known Bill a long time. Bill, Bill was a football writer back in the day. He was an NFL writer, sure. the LA Times, and we we well, covered. I know. Bill's a, Bill's a legend. He is. But to have He's a legend to talk yeah. about, I was like, come on, man. I was like, uh, you know, the it's uh, an honor. And did he shake your hand? And it was a little bit limp. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. He hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Love you, Flash. All right, Tim. Thank you for having me, man. See you. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed, Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We'll be right back.